Welcome to Excelsior 20, sir. Academic session on vascular anatomy of brain. Good morning and welcome, sir. Hello, thank you, Ashley. So shall I uh, share the screen now or? Sure, sir, you can share the screen, screen right. Uh, all right, just a minute, just. All right, I hope I'm audible and uh, my screen is visible. Yes, so, sir. So, do you want me to ask the question by the audience in between or at the end of this session? Uh, in, in, in the midst of my session, I'll have a few questions. I have a small okay. quiz-like arrangement, uh, almost short question, uh, five questions. Okay, uh, maybe. Uh, but, uh, okay. but I think, uh, uh, so I, I'll have chat answers. Is that how it will be? Okay, sir. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll have chat answers. Yes. Uh, they they can they can give the chat answers. Uh, I I'll be able to view the chats, th their answers, or yes, sir. You will be able to view. You'll be all, able right, to all, right. all right. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. So, uh, all right. So can I can I start? Yeah. So. Yeah. So the topic is vascular anatomy of the brain. Uh, why I I hope. Uh, the IMAMSN uh, asked me to do this topic is because mostly it is important for clinical practice and uh, as far as medical students are concerned for their exams, either be it first year or in final year, or if they are preparing for their further uh, higher studies or entrances. Uh, neuroanatomy is a very interesting topic and vascular anatomy uh, thus is very important, especially in practice point of view. Uh, having a good idea about vascular anatomy will definitely help you, give you an edge uh, in your uh, studies and in your practice. So uh, I, this is a very vast topic, but I'll be just briefing through this uh, so that uh, you may be able to get at least some points uh, according to your current knowledge. Okay. So before I start, I'll just have a review some basics in a, uh, three slides I prepared. Uh, one is uh, the functional anatomy of the cerebrum. This is very important for you to understand the vascular anatomy. Uh, because you will basically be uh, uh, overlapping the functional map with the vascular territory map that you will be learning. So uh, I'll just mention some of the important functional areas. This is not a, a whole list, but the, only the most important functional areas. One of the most important functional area in the cerebrum that you will learn is the sensory motor cortices. Uh, the, as you can see, this is a top view of the cerebrum. This is the motor cortex shown as red. Okay, uh, This is the coronal section view of that, the same. This is the medial surface, this is the lateral surface, superlateral surface. And behind what is shown as blue is the sensory cortex. Together it is considered as uh, somato, uh, the uh, sensory motor cortices. Uh, this is found in the pre-central and post-central gyrus uh, occupying a, a, this format in the cerebrum. So this is called the motor and the sensory homunculus. Homunculus means a little man. As you can see, uh, the representation here is the head arm and leg arranged in such a manner that the head and arm is on the superolateral surface and the leg is on the medial surface. This is a very uh, well aware uh, homunculus representation. And this is very important to be known when you learn the uh, vascular anatomy territory. So this is that same brain. This is the superolateral surface and this is the medial surface. You can see the head, the face, uh, hand, arm, trunk and the leg arrangement. Uh, the same homunculus represented like this. This is a very important map that you need to know, know uh, uh, because any insults over here, you will have an involvement of the head and the arm. Any insults over here, you will have involvement of the leg, okay. uh, preferable, uh, preferential involvement of the leg. So that is why this map is very important. So that is a sensory motor cortex. Uh, another uh, important area that should be known is the Broca's area. Broca's area is the motor speech area found on the left side. You can see this image is the left cerebrum and uh, you can see that this representation in 90% of people, this is on the left side. It should be noted that in a rare uh, population, it can be on both sides or it can be on the right side also. But most commonly for practical purposes, you can think on the left side, the inferior frontal gyrus the specific areas are pars triangularis and pars opicularis, area number 44. 
that area is called broadcast area this is the motor speech area because this area will be programming the area of the face and the head to do the speech okay to to perform this so articulatory program for speech will be done by the uh, broadcast area so this is also very important so you have if you have an insult in this region it will cause a motor aphasia okay so uh, that that is that is the importance of broadcast area also called motor speech area the next area that i want you to understand is a wernicke's area wernicke's areas are represented in the superior temporal gyrus on the posterior aspect some authors mention this as the supra marginal gyrus and the angular gyrus that is also right that is according to a different school of thought it is called the jeschwin's area uh, but uh, that also can be included under wernicke's area uh, but this representation from a standard book called blumenfeld uh, shows wernicke's area as area number 22 behind the secondary auditory area this is in the superior temporal gyrus this is again on the left side so right away you can understand that the left side cortex is preferentially involved in language function production of the articulatory program and also comprehension of language so these two are functions preferentially on the left side this is a very important functional lateralization of the cerebrum as most of you are aware so that is on the left side so you have, you have the approximate statistic is 90% okay Uh, so that is about wernicke's area the next area very important area that you have to know is the visual cortex the visual cortex is found this is a medial uh, cut, uh, midline sagittal section view in which you can see the visual cortex here the visual cortex is found around okay it is found around the calcarine surface and what is shown here as uh, red dotted lines is actually the visual radiations or the optic radiations this is arising from the thalamus the posterior part of the thalamus called the lateral genital nucleus from that point these two fibers will sort of fan out okay fan out from anterior to posterior it will fan out and uh, uh, that will that 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 fanning out uh, is called the optic radiation so if you have insults on uh, the uh, optic radiation or the visual cortexes of one side it will cause a contralateral field deficit that is very important if you have a deficit uh, if you have a lesion uh, uh, suppose you have a thrombotic stroke in the visual in the uh, uh, in the uh, occipital cortex that will cause or the of the right side that will cause the left side homonymous hemianopia okay uh, and if it is uh, occurring in the parietal cortices or in the temporal cortices due to the profile of that optic radiations that will also cause visual deficit so not only the occipital but also temporal and parietal can also cause field deficit because these fibers the optic radiation fibers coming from the thalamus are actually sweeping out through the parietal and the temporal to reach the occipital okay so it is not just a role of the occipital so this is a most important functional uh, areas that you need to know to have an understanding of vascular tree anatomy there are many other functional areas but uh, this are the most important that you need to know so the next uh, basic idea that i i want you to understand this is a sectional anatomy view Uh, you are aware that this is called the uh, this is a coronal section and in this coronal section you are aware that this is called the cerebral cortex and underneath the cortex is you have the white matter so this region you can think that that is a superficial part of the cerebrum but on the deeper aspect you have some very important structures for example these structures that you find here are the basal ganglia and this structure that you find near the midline on both sides of the midline they are the thalamus okay now between the thalamus and the basal ganglia you have a white matter tract and that is called the internal capsule that is extremely important if you if you are in later stages of your uh, uh, studies in uh, as medical student you know the importance of internal capsule by seeing cases of stroke okay many cases of stroke uh, particularly occurs in the internal capsule so this is also a very important fiber tract that is potentially vulnerable for uh, thrombotic uh, uh, insults so you need to know the anatomy of this part also extremely um, more, uh, as uh, as much as you know you need to know the functional areas you need to know how these are arranged in the internal capsule also so this structure is called internal capsule now i'm going to uh, another uh, view over here this is the uh, an axial section in an axial section you can see uh, another this is the anterior this is the posterior aspect here again you can see the cortex beautifully arranged like a ribbon on the outside and deeper you can see the basal ganglia with the caudate the lentiform and the thalamus the two thalamus are uh, near by each other between that you can see the internal capsule this is the internal capsule internal capsule has an anterior limb a genu and the posterior limb and this is called the retro lentiform part all these parts are extremely important to understand vascular tertiaries 
So uh, you, here you need to understand one more thing. This is the superficial aspect of the cerebrum and this is the deeper aspect of the cerebrum. You need to understand the cerebral uh, vascular supply in under these two heads, uh, preferably uh, to understand, to, uh, to learn more in more depth about the vascular anatomy. Now, the next thing I usually uh, uh, tell students is to have a boxing glove analogy of the entire cerebral lobe. This is a boxing glove and it, uh, somewhat the cerebral lobes looks like the, uh, the cerebral hemisphere looks somewhat like a boxing glove. You can think that this thumb in the boxing glove is the temporal lobe and this entire other fingers is forming the frontal and the temporal lobe, uh, frontal and the parietal lobes. So this idea is helpful because actually if you separate the, in that boxing glove, if you actually separate the, the, the thumb from the other fingers, you can actually see another lobe in the depth. Okay, all these colored ones are the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. But if you separate the boxing glove, if you can imagine like that, on the depth you have the insula. Okay, this idea is important because the insula is actually lo located a little deep. Okay, if you have seen a brain uh, specimen, you can understand how much you, you have to separate these two. Uh, these are called opercular, the frontal, uh, parietal, and the temporal opercular. Opercular, the word means lid. So if you open the lid, you can see the deeply treasured insula. This idea is important because a very important artery that you are going to learn, the MCA lights in this vicinity. It lies on the insula, it comes, climbs up the opercular and it comes to the surface. So this idea is also very important. So these are the uh, basic uh, things that I need you to prerequisite to that I think if you know these things, it will be very good. So I'll uh, do the vascular anatomy, understand the vascular anatomy under two heads, arterial anatomy and venous anatomy. I'll be focusing on arterial anatomy and I hope I can complete it uh, within my allotted time. Uh, if I complete it, I'll just brush through the venous anatomy I'm not going into much details of it uh, because it's more complex. So I'll, I'll focus on arterial anatomy and if time winds up, I'll finish with arterial anatomy. <laughs> so uh, I'll, in, bit, I'll, in the midst, I'll again have a short quiz just to wake you up. Okay. So uh, first I'll go to the arterial anatomy. Uh, this is the entire brain. Uh, one point I need students to always understand is brain. Of course, the largest component of the brain is cerebrum, but always remember brain does not contain cerebrum alone. It also contains brain stem and the cerebellum. So that idea should always be in mind, especially for uh, early year students. You always remember brain is, though uh, our initial mental image is the cerebrum, you need to understand the very important structures like brain stem and the cerebellum as part of the brain itself. So brain contains cerebrum and I, I'll be dealing it like this. It will be containing cerebrum, it will be containing brain stem and, it'll, and uh, cerebellum. So I'll, uh, and within the cerebrum, uh, I can uh, put it under two heads. I can uh, say that it has a superficial part as I showed in that section image. It has a superficial part containing the cortex and the subcortical white matter, but it also contains a deeper part containing basal ganglia, internal capsule, thalamus, that, are, that comes under a deeper aspect. If you, uh, if you come from an anatomy background, you know that there is an entity called diencephalon. Parts of diencephalon are within the deeper part. Okay. So I'll, I, but I'll not go uh, to the diencephalon part. I'll say it as the cerebrum, the superficial part of the cerebrum and the deeper part of the cerebrum. So I'll be dealing the vascular anatomy like this from the superficial, then the deep, then the brainstem, then the cerebellum. So I'll be going like this. Okay. Cerebrum, I'll deal with superficial, deep, then brainstem, then cerebellum. Okay, so uh, I always say, uh, you can think that cerebrum almost looks like a cauliflower and uh, the, the brainstem look like, looks like the stalk of that cauliflower and cerebellum looks like a small cauliflower located behind and below the a large cauliflower. Okay. That, that is one simile that, that is told by one of uh, my great teachers. All right, now uh, this is one, uh, la one demarcation, one boundary that I need you to remember as a mental image because uh, this, I told you this is the entire brain. Within that, if you draw a faint line like this in your mind, you can think that in front and above this demarcation, you have what is called uh, the territory that is supplied by the carotid arteries, okay, internal carotid arteries. That is called the anterior circulation. Below this demarcation line, this much part of, that is the inferior and posterior aspect of the cerebrum and the brainstem and cerebellum that is supplied by the posterior circulation, which is, uh, uh, which is served by the vertebro basilar system. So the vertebral arteries are going to supply the posterior circulation, this much part of the brain 
and anterior circulation is served by the internal carotid arteries that forms the this part of the brain okay uh, if you took take a, a statistic uh, according to the blood volume 80% or almost 70% uh, will be by the anterior circulation and uh, 30% maybe by the posterior circulation but that should not uh, uh, you know uh, that should not deceive you by from the importance of posterior circulation though that is a volumetric statistic uh, both of them are very important okay both of them are very important a posterior circulation stroke can be equal or even more devastating uh, when you compare with an anterior circulation stroke so uh, both of them are important though volumetrically anterior circulation may be serving more of the brain and uh, due to that reason more of blood volume will be carried by the anterior circulation also so uh, th this is one idea that you need to remember so uh, this this is a, um, a schematic uh, image that is showing the arteries that are going to supply the brain you know that this is the arch of the aorta from the arch of the aorta you have the brachiocephalic this is the right side and this is the left side from the right side you know you have a brachiocephalic and on the left side you have the left common carotid and the left subclavian the left common carotid will divide into an external carotid and an internal carotid. The internal carotid is going to supply the, the brain. As I mentioned before, it is going to serve the anterior circle. You can see the internal carotid coming from this side. The only difference here is that the common carotid is not a direct branch of the arch of the aorta. It is a branch of the brachiocephalic. Okay. Now from the brachiocephalic, you also have the, the right subclavian, the right subclavian is again giving the vertebral arteries. So the two vertebral arteries is going to supply the posterior circulation. The two internal carotids are going to supply the anterior circulation. The, all these are coming directly or indirectly from the arch of the aorta. This is important because this is the most usual pattern, but there can be so much variation. So this can directly arise from the aorta. Okay. So many variations are described already and relatively common also. Now, one more thing I want you to remember is the aorta is arising from the ascending aorta. This part will be ascending aorta, which is coming from the left ventricle. That is also important because many of the embolus that are going to cause embolic strokes will be either from the carotid system, it can be from the aorta rarely, or it can be from a mural thrombus of the heart. So these are all sources of emboli that can eventually end up in a uh, in an embolic stroke so you need to that's why neck that's why in uh, in uh, clinical examination it is always said in a stroke case you need to auscultate the neck for brewy in the carotid uh, so that that all these things are uh, pretty important you need to know the origin of these arteries so four arteries okay that's the point you need to remember two internal carotids and two vertebral arteries are going to supply the brain so we are now going to trace how these arteries are going and what are the segments of these arteries. Now this is the uh, right side lateral view, a beautiful picture by Nethers, and it shows the, the, uh, the common carotid dividing into internal carotid and external carotid. The internal carotid is more usually in line with the common carotid, almost in a, in a 180 degree, okay, almost in line. The external carotid is more deviating out. And within the neck, if you are a neck, surgeon if you are or, or you are in the surgical field of the neck the most or, or in the anatomical dissection the most important identifying feature is external carotid will have branches in the neck internal carotid will rarely have branches it may have very fine branches but usually it is branchless within the neck okay it goes ascends up here you can see a carotid uh, sinus which is important as a barrow receptor you can see carotid body here okay. so we, we are now going into how this is coursing up this part in the neck is called the cervical part. As you can see, ICA or the internal carotid artery and the VA, vertebral artery, has four segments. The internal carotid, this segment is called the cervical part. The cervical part ascends up the neck. At the base of the skull, it will enter into the carotid canal. It will drill through the carot through the petrous part of the temporal bone that is called the petrous segment. Okay. And the next, after it emerges out from the petrous segment, it will be found within the caverns of the cavernous sinus, okay? Within the cavernous sinus, that is called the cavernous segment. And then it will pierce the dura after which is called the cerebral segment. So these are the four classic anatomic segments described in internal carotid. The cervical, the petrous or intrapetrous, and the next is the cavernous and the next is the cerebral part. The cerebral part will be found out, out after piercing the dura. Okay, these are the four segments. Now, the four segment is a classic anatomical segmentation. Uh, in entrance questions, you may be asked what is Bothlier classification. It is an angiographic uh, classification of the internal carotid. 
the, the, there it is divided into seven segments. Okay, uh, the details of the segments I'm not going into that, but you need to know seven segment classification of internal carotid is called both layer classification. Now I'm going into the vertebral artery, which again has four segments. Vertebral arteries are arising from the subclavian, as you can see here. It is from the subclavian. That is important because in uh, this is important to understand uh, the, the subclavian steel phenomenon. In a case of uh, vertebral artery occlusion, you can have something called subclavian steel phenomenon. Uh, to understand that, you need to know it is a branch of the subclavian. So uh, this is the vertebral artery arising from the first part of subclavian that runs backwards and then it enters into the foramen transverse area of C6 and then it ascends up C5, 4, 3, 2, and then it comes out and uh, it, it enters into the one, into the uh, atlas vertebra foramen transverse area. Then it sort of pe it, uh, becomes present in the suboccipital triangle and then it pierces the dura and then it enters into the cranium. Okay, this is the V4 segment. So this is the V1. This is V2. The V1 is called the pre uh, foraminal segment. The V2 is called the foraminal segment because it is running within the foramina. And finally, it will it will be related to the atlas vertebra that is called the Atlantic segment. Okay, and after that, it will pierce the dura, and after that, it is called the intradural segment. Also, some some say intracranial segment. So that is the V4, okay, V4 part. So you can remember the similarity. Both of them are four parts, and uh, uh, all all these uh, you can have insults within this part. Not you can have a stroke due to insults within this part also. You can have a artery dissection here, a carotid dissection, a vertebral artery dissection, which can all cause strokes. Okay, so the the neck course is also as equally important as within the cranium course. Now you can see over here. I, I already mentioned the vertebral arteries are going and uh, they, are, they are joining together to form the basilar artery. You can see the two vertebral arteries are joining to form the basilar. Uh, this is the internal carotid. And you can see a, a curious phenomenon here, the internal carotid, which is supplying the anterior circulation, and the vertebro basilar, which is supplying the posterior circulation, are anastomosing here, or they are connecting here. This connection is called, this connection is found in the base of the skull. You know that this is the, uh, the uh, the pituitary fossa around the pituitary fossa you can see an anastomotic circle and that is called the circle of willis any description of the uh, blood supply of the brain uh, is incomplete if you don't go to the circle of willis okay it's a very commonly asked question in your exams and uh, this is the circle of willis we will know the basic pattern of how to draw a circle of willis you need to not draw the two vertebral arteries joining a two arteries joining to form a single artery that's one of the unique phenomenon uh, relatively unique phenomenon occurring within the uh, within the arterial tree in our body so together forming the basilar artery this occurs at the ponto medullary junction okay at the junction between the medulla and the pons till the medulla you have the vertebral arteries then it becomes the basilar artery the basilar artery climbs up the pons it divides into two these two are the pca or the posterior cerebral arteries so that is the vertebro basilar system, the basic outline of the vertebro basilar system. Next, we'll go to the internal carotid system. This is the internal carotid artery. Internal carotid artery, you are seeing the internal carotid artery end on. It is going like this. Okay, that internal carotid artery is dividing into its terminal branches. The terminal branches are the ACA, anterior cerebral artery, and the MCA, middle cerebral artery. Okay, this is ACA and this is MCA. Okay, these are the the three cerebral arteries, you can see the ACA and MCA are the terminal branches of the internal carotid. The PCA is the terminal branch of the basilar artery, which is formed from the vertebral artery. So the posterior circulation ends in the terminal branch PCA. The anterior circulation ends in the terminal branches ACA and MCA. You can see over here, the ICA, the internal carotid artery, uh, the, I, I'll use abbreviations throughout. ICA means internal carotid artery. ICA is going to split into a T formation. Okay, this is called the T formation. This is the ACA and this is the MCA. That is a T split of the ICA. Now you can, as I mentioned in the previous picture, you can see an anastomosis between this posterior circulation and the anterior circulation. So that anastomotic uh, branch, very important anastomotic branch is called posterior communicating artery. It should not be confused. This is called PCOM or the posterior communicating artery. Posterior communicating artery is a branch of the internal carotid. Okay, it is a branch of the internal carotid. There are developmental reasons for considering this. This is branch of the internal carotid. 
Okay. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this is called circle of Willis, though this does not look like a circle. It actually looks like a polygon. Uh, the two anterior cerebral arteries of both sides will be anastomosed by another communicating artery. This is called a comb, anterior communicating artery. So you have two P comms on both sides. They are branches of the internal carotid and you have a single A comb connecting the two ACAs. Okay, this is the pattern. This is how the the uh, the cir circle of Willis is completed. Okay, this is how the circle of Willis is completed. Now, before I go into more details, I want to you to mention. I want you to understand the important branches of the circle of Willis. Okay, I'll classify these branches as large caliber branches and small caliber branches. So first, I'll go to the large caliber branches that you need to remember. From the vertebral artery. Always remember from the vertebral artery, you have a very important branch called pica, posterior inferior cerebellar artery. That is a branch of vertebral artery, it should not be confused. It's not shown in this picture, unfortunately. Now, it bo both of these vertebral arteries join here and it forms the basal artery. From that point and the lower part of the basal artery, you have the ica or the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So two cerebellar arteries from the initial part of vertebral basal system, pica and ica. From the ICA, you usually have the labyrinthine artery, which will be going to supply the internal ear. The labyrinthine artery can also arise from the basal artery directly. Okay, it can be from ICA or from the basal. Now, as it ascends up, just before terminating into the two PCAs, it will give off one more cerebral artery, cerebellar artery. This is called the superior cerebellar artery. So you have three cerebellar arteries, and all of them are coming from the vertebral basal system. Pica from the vertebral. ICA from the lower part of basal and SCA or superior cerebellar artery from the upper part of the uh, basal artery. You also have penetrating branches, fine caliber branches here. These fine caliber branches are going, I told you basal artery is hugging the pons. It is lying in the pre-pontine cistern. So these branches is going to penetrate the pons. These are called the pontine penetrating branches. You also have penetrating branches coming from the vertebral artery, which is going to supply the medulla because here the relation is medulla, here the relation is pons. Right. Now, uh, we are going into the, uh, the internal carotid. You have a, very, a couple of very important arteries of internal carotid. Internal carotid terminates in the anterior cerebral and middle cerebral. These two are the important terminal branches. What are the other branches of internal carotid? After it pierces the dura, it gives off one very important branch and this branch is called the ophthalmic artery. Remember, ophthalmic artery is a branch of internal carotid. You might remember in development that eye actually develops from a, as an extension of the brain. So this is a reminiscent of that. The internal carotid is giving off, internal carotid which is supplying the brain is giving off the ophthalmic artery. Another branch is the PCOM, which I already mentioned. PCOM is a branch of the internal carotid. Okay, so O, P and next is this branch. This is one of the most forgotten branch of uh, by uh, medical students. This is the anterior choroidal. Always remember anterior choroidal artery is a branch of internal carotid. So you can remember this with a mnemonic if you want. O, P, A and A, M. Okay. O is ophthalmic. P is PCOM, posterior communicating. A is anterior choroidal. It's a very small artery. If you do dissection, you, you will f find this as a very small artery, but it's a very important artery. If you actually injure this artery, you can leave the patient. If it's a neurosurgical table, if you injure this artery, you can leave the patient hemiplegic. Okay, because that is the importance of this artery. It is called an anterior choroidal artery. And the next, the two terminal branches is anterior cerebral, and the next is middle cerebral. Apart from this large branches, you can see smaller branches. These are all fine caliber branches. Fine caliber branches are something like, looks, looks like hair, hair, uh, hairy, uh, uh, out, uh, hairy processes from this circle of villas if you do uh, uh, formal and fixed specimen dissection uh, without a, a magnifying loop. If you do that, it just looks like hair. They're very, very small, but these arteries are all very important. Okay, because these are going to supply the core of the brain and that way, that's why if you have a, an occlusion of one of these arteries, it can eventually cause a thrombosis or a lacuna stroke or a rupture of these arteries can cause a hemorrhage. Uh, so these arteries, though it looks very small and subtle, these arteries are also very important. These are together called central branches. There is a classification for each of this, but I'm not going into that. But among all these fine caliber branches, these branches are the most important. These branches are coming from the middle cerebral artery, initial part, or the stem of the middle cerebral artery. This is called the lenticulostriate artery. So that is about the circle of Willis. I'll uh, 
before I go uh, further, I told you this is a most common pattern, but you can see another pattern that you find here. What is the major difference here? You can see that uh, the, the basilar artery is not dividing into two uh, posterior cerebrals. It looks like it is only one and the other one has uh, it's become absent or it has become hypoplastic. In that case, you can have another pattern called uh, the, this posterior cerebral artery will be supplied from the internal carotid artery itself. Because the reason is the posterior communicating artery in this case is larger than this segment. This segment is called the pre-communal segment or the P1 segment of the posterior cerebral. So if the P1 segment becomes smaller, this artery becomes larger. What is the significance of this? Can you, can you imagine what is the significance of this? If you, if this is this pattern, this is the most common pattern. If you have an internal carotid artery occlusion, it will cause anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery stroke. But in this case, if you have an internal carotid artery occlusion, you will have uh, the territory involvement of ACA, MCA, as well as PCA. Okay, this format is called by the name fetal PCOM and it is very common. Look at the percentage. It is approximately in 20 to 30 percent of people. You can have a fetal PCOM and this is called fetal PCOM. Why it is called fetal PCOM? I mentioned initially that PCOM is considered as a branch of internal carotid. Actually, this is the initial fetal pattern where all the cerebral arteries are supplied by the internal carotid, but then the basal artery takes it over. So if that doesn't happen, the, the, the posterior cerebral will be supplied by the internal carotid through the larger PCOM. Okay. So this is called a fetal PCOM pattern. The, the importance lies in the stroke pattern in which ACA, MCA and uh, posterior cerebral of one side can be involved in an internal carotid artery stroke. I hope the point is clear. Now, uh, though this is an, uh, a diagram that we draw very often, but uh, apart from that, you need to understand this pattern also. Uh, opposing this on the brain. This is where you find the circle of villus. Okay, this is the circle. This is you can see the internal carotid artery end on dividing in a T pattern into anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral. You can see the middle cerebral is entering into the lateral sulcus. You can also see the basilar artery. This is the vertebral. The two vertebral arteries are joining at the ponto medullary junction and opposing on to the it is lying on the Pons. I told you these fine branches are the pontine branches that is going to supply the pons. This is the superior cerebellar artery. These are the uh, anterior inferior cerebellar arteries and this is the posterior inferior cerebellar. You can see all these arteries are going to supply the cerebellar. All right. Now these are the posterior cerebral arteries. Uh, you, can, you can see the internal carotid artery splitting into MCA and the ACA and you need to have an idea looking at this brain you need to have an idea where these arteries are going into the anterior cerebral is coming close to each other as you can look at this picture it is coming close to each other it is rising up and hooking or it is lying above the uh, the corpus callosum so the two anterior cerebral arteries are lying very close to each other on the corpus callosum in the in, uh, in the interhemispheric fissure in the depth of the interhemispheric fissure so in uh, anatomy if you actually separate the two uh, cerebral hemispheres you can see the anterior cerebral artery lying on the corpus callosum they will be very close to each other and in the root of it in the initial part of it you can see the both of these anterior cerebrals are communicated by the acom Okay. Now you can also see from the internal carotid, you can see the anastomotic channel with the posterior cerebral. This is the P1 segment, the initial segment of posterior cerebral. That is a P1 segment. After the anastomosis, it is called P2 segment. Okay. So these are the this is the pattern that you see in the base of the brain. Now I want to to, to see a couple of uh, branches that are very important. As I said before, these are called the lenticulostriate branches. Okay, the lenticulostriate branches, the perforating branches coming from fine caliber branches coming from the middle cerebral artery initial part. This is called the stem of the MCA, stem of the MCA. You can see the stem of the MCA here and you can see those fine branches rising up. They are soon penetrating the brain. Where, is, where are they penetrating the brain? They are penetrating the brain at the anterior perforated substance. That is why the anterior perforated substance becomes perforated. Okay. Now, along with this anterior perforated substance, along with these arteries that you see, the lenticulostriate, you can see one more artery, a very curious artery. That artery is coming from the anterior cerebral at the junction between the A1 and A2. What is A1 and A2? The 
before the acom this segment is called a1 segment after the acom this segment is called a2 segment at that junction you can see a, a very small artery can you see the small artery this small artery runs backwards backwards and joins these lenticulostriate branches in penetrating the brain you can see that artery over here okay this is that artery representation this artery is running back the anterior uh, the anterior cerebral was running like this but this small artery is running backwards that is why it's called a recurrent artery it is having a recurrent course so this recurrent artery is called the recurrent artery of hubner the recurrent artery of hubner is arising from the aca at the junction between a1 and a2 this is also joining the lenticulostriate branches at the most medial part the lenticulostriate branches are also called the lateral striate branches and this branch is also called the distal medial striate branch the recurrent artery of hubner so i want you to remember these two branches i'll be uh, coming to these again later in my quiz part okay you just remember this is the anterior cerebral recurrent artery also called artery of hubner and these lentic these are the lenticulostriate arteries okay these though they are very subtle looking very small okay looking very simple humble they are very very important now uh, this is the anterior cerebral and uh, this is the middle cerebral so though this is the diagram that you usually draw you need to know how these are coursing the anterior cerebral are coming very close the middle cerebral are going out into the, uh, the into the stem of the lateral sulcus this is the stem of the lateral sulcus the posterior cerebral so i didn't mention about posterior cerebral where is the posterior cerebral going into posterior cerebral is going to wind the Uh, midbrain this is the medulla this is the pons and this is the midbrain so these two posterior cerebrals are going to wind the midbrain so that is a course uh, imagination that you need to have anterior cerebral in my body anterior cerebral will be running close to each other near the midline middle cerebral will be running in the uh, in the sylvian fisher stem the posterior cerebrals will be winding the midbrain posteriorly okay so that is the, the course the main course of the three arteries now more details about the circle of willis branches a little more details i told you these fine branches coming from the p1 segment that is going to penetrate the posterior perforated substance these branches coming from the mca initial part m1 segment that is going to pierce the uh, the anterior perforated so you have two anterior perforated substance here and you have a posterior perforated substance here all these are going to supply the core of the brain i told you in the initial slide this is going to supply the core of the brain now Uh, this is the artery that i mentioned before this is the internal carotid this is the mca and this is the aca this is the anterior choroidal the job of the anterior choroidal is to form the choroid plexus of the ventricle that's why the name is like that but the anterior choroidal is also supplying the core of the brain especially parts of the internal capsule so that is the importance of anterior choroidal okay you can see the posterior cerebral clearly winding the midbrain you can see it winding the midbrain clearly okay winding the midbrain this is actually lying in the cistern in the ambient cistern or the perimesencephalic cistern the cistern means a, a space in the subarachnoid space so these are the posterior cerebrals winding the midbrain this is the middle cerebral artery going laterally and this is the anterior cerebral artery coming very close to each other okay so uh, that, that that is about uh, the the uh, the finer caliber branches that you see over here and the anterior cerebral Uh, and the anterior choroidal the anterior choroidal is found just inferior to the optic tract okay that is also an important relation it is found just inferior to the optic tract as you can see here from the posterior cerebral you also have the posterior choroidal artery so it will be joining the anterior choroidal to form the choroid plexus all right now uh, this is one important point that i want you to remember all these arteries that i mentioned over here or or the cortical branches that i'm going to mention all these branches are lying in the subarachnoid space okay this is a section image in that uh, uh, picture in which you can see the dura here you can see the arachnoid here and what is shown as green is the pia mater above the pia you have all this arteries the cerebral arteries located this is the dura that is exposed once you lift up the dura underneath that you have a flimsy spider web like layer that is arachnoid under the arachnoid you have all these vessels so suppose you the one of these vessels ruptures outside the brain then that will cause bleeding into the subarachnoid space that is why it is very important to know that the vessels are lying in the subarachnoid space all these arteries all these cortical arteries and all this the circle of willis are 
uh, lying in the subarachnoid space or their systems. Here you will have systems. I have already mentioned the basilar is lying in the prepontine system. The circle of villicel is lying in the chiasmatic and the suprachiasmatic system. This is lying in the pre, uh, the interpedangular system. And this uh, posterior cerebral is lying in the perimesencephalic or the ambient system. Okay, all this are lying in subarachnoid space. If you have rupture of any of these vessels before it enters cerebrum, it will cause a subarachnoid bleed and I say hemorrhage, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that is about the, uh, the outside, the, the main course of the circle of villus. Now I'll go to the territories in the superficial part, then the deep part, then the brainstem and the cerebellum. Okay. Now first I'll go to the uh, superficial blood supply. Uh, first, I go to middle cerebral artery. Of all these cerebral arteries, MCA is the most important one that you have to learn because that is the largest of the, all these three branches, ACA, MCA, and PCA. And MCA is the one that is most commonly affected by diseases. You have MCA strokes more common than ACA and PCA if you look at the statistics. So uh, this is the MCA. So I'm going to trace the course of the MCA. MCA, as I told, is, is a terminal branch of the internal carotid. It lies in the stem of the lateral sulcus. It goes laterally. It divides into two branches. You can see it is arising from the uh, anterior, uh, from the internal carotid. It lies in the stem of the lateral sulcus. It is actually long. This is a foreshortened view. You can see how long it is if you look from the inferior aspect. So it is long like this. Then it divides into two divisions. These are called the superior and the inferior divisions. This is the superior division and this is the inferior division. The superior division the, and the inferior division is lying on the insula. I told you this, this is how the boxing glove is separated and they, I, I told you this is, these arteries are lying in the depth on the insula, on the surface of the insula. So from that point, the branches will climb up the opercula, the frontal operculum, the parietal operculum, and the temporal operculum, and then it will lie in the cortex. It is called the cortical branches. So there are total four segments for the middle cerebral artery. All these are important. I'm mentioning only about segments of the MCA. I'm not dealing about the other segments. This is the M1 segment. M1 segment lies in the stem of the lateral circus. That is also called the sphenoidal segment. The M1 segment is important, very important, because that will also give off the lenticulostriate branches. Okay, so if you have an occlusion of the M1 proximal segment, that will have uh, uh, the, the territory involvement will be the entire MCA territory, as well as these penetrating, important penetrating branches. Okay, then it will lie on the insula. That segment is called the M2 segment, also called insular segment. That is a, uh, that will be lying on the surface of the insula. Once it reaches this sulcus, this sulcus is called the, the circular circles of the insula. Once it reaches there, it will then climb up. Okay, climb up the opercula, and that is called the opercular segment or M3 segment. After that, it will it will come out. Okay, till then it is in the depth. From the depth, it will climb up. Then it will come out into the surface, and that is called the cortical branches. And the cortical branches, if you look at the territory, this is the territory of the MCA. The largest territory is by the MCA. Or if you look at the cortical surface, okay, it will spare only this much part, which will be supplied by the ACA, and this much part will be supplied by PCA branches. Other than this, this much enormous area will be supplied by MCA. If you if you try to overlap the functional maps, you can understand that a left MCA cortical stroke will have involvement of Broca's area. It will have involvement of the, ha the head area, the arm area. It will have involvement of Wernicke. Okay? That is why I told you that you have to learn the functional map initially and then uh, overlap that to the territorial maps that you learn in, um, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the arterial anatomy. So imagine as a curious, imagine a particular case in which only the superior division is involved. Only if, if the superior division is involved, you will have Broca's area involved. You will have the hand and arm uh, areas, I mean the head and the, uh, some arm areas of the uh, sensory motor cortices, but you will have somewhat sparing of the Wernicke's area. Okay, all right, so you can have different patterns depending upon which part of the MCA is involved. MCA is one of the arteries that is most frequently involved. Uh, if it is involving this part, it will have only superior division, inferior division involvement. If it is having involvement in this part, it will have superior division, inferior division, as well as the lenticulostriate branch involvement. So it actually depends on the location of the insult. Okay, that is why all the divisions of uh, the MCA are quite important. The scores and all the divisions of MCA are quite important. 
So now I'll go to the AC and PCA. Quick idea about AC and PCA. AC is running like this. They are very close to each other. This is the right side. And you can see it running over. You can see how the AC is uh, climbing up above the optic ism, coming very close to each other, joined by the ACOM or the anterior communicating. Uh, beyond that, it is running up over the corpus callosum okay, to supply this much part of the medial cerebral surface. So the medial cerebral surface mainly is supplied by the anterior cerebral. Okay, mainly supplied by the anterior cerebral. Next, we are going into the PCA. As I mentioned, PCA is enveloping. It is circling the it is circling the midbrain. This is the midbrain. It is circling the midbrain. So you can see it is circling the midbrain in this picture. You can also see it is encircling the midbrain in this picture also. Okay, so that is the piece. This is the P1 segment, and this is the P2 anterior, P2 posterior, P3, and P4 segments. The segments are not needed. So this is the P4 segments. Note that this is supplying the inferior surface of temporal lobe. It is also supplying the very important uh, occipital cortex where you have the important functional area, the visual, the primary visual area. So if you have a PCA involvement in a stroke, you will have a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. Okay, if you have an entire PCA stroke involving the entire visual cortex of right side, you'll have a left homonymous hemianopia. If you have a stroke of the ACA, you can have a one on one, one side alone, you can have a contralateral uh, monoplegia of the lower limb because you will have leg involvement, preferential leg involvement, the hands and the face will be spared. Okay. And uh, suppose you have only the superior division involvement, you will have preferential involvement of face and the hand that is called a preferential fasciobrachial monoplegia. So an MCA cortical stroke can cause a fasciobrachial monoplegia if it is a superior division. An ACA, uh, in fact, can cause a monoplegia of the opposite side on the lower limb. A PCA can cause visual symptoms. See how the cortical map, functional map, is important to understand how the patient will present if each of these territories are involved. Okay, so these territories can be easily remembered if you know the basic course of these arteries. That's why anatomy is very important. Uh, this basic course, how the PCA winds the midbrain and gains the posterior surface of cerebrum, how the ACA climbs up the corpus callosum, and how the MCA is going within the, uh, the lateral sulcus and running, uh, lying, uh, running inside the depth of the insula and climbing out into the surface. So that will give you a whole idea about how the cortical territories are demarcated. Now I told you about anterior circulation and posterior circulation. Another important vascular uh, anomaly that you need to uh, learn is this. This is called saccular aneurysms or Berry aneurysms. Okay, this can be congenital, but this can also occur due to hypertension. And uh, the according to statistics, uh, according to uh, the disease presentation, 85% of Berry aneurysms are found on the anterior circulation. That is the internal carotid, MCA, PCA, PCOM, everything is, comes under the anterior circulation. That accounts to 85% of Berry aneurysms. And the posterior circulation is more rare. You have 15% of Berry aneurysms for the posterior circulations. Okay, suppose this aneurysms ruptures, it can cause a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is an axial CT image where you can see acute blood, acute blood in a CT. The CT is one of the primary investigations that you may be doing uh, in, in a stroke case. And that will cause uh, all the subarachnoid cisterns. Here you actually you have the suprachiasmatic cistern that is filled with blood. So that, that, that shows that one of these aneurysms may have ruptured. Uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage can be caused due to trauma, but non-traumatic causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage is aneurysm rupture. And from your basic idea of anatomy, you need to understand that anterior circulation is more common for aneurysms. You can have aneurysms very, uh, very uh, bizarre locations. One of the uh, regions of aneurysm that is usually asked in uh, entrance examinations is this one. This is called a PCOM aneurysm. You can see the, this is this is the PCOM. Okay, the PCOM aneurysm. If if you have a PCOM, the posterior communicating aneurysm, it can uh, classically compress the oculomotor nerve and causes and so oculomotor is going to supply the external ocular extraocular muscles a pcom aneurysm can cause an ophthalmoplegia so an aneurysm that can cause an ophthalmoplegia usually as a painful ophthalmoplegia is uh, a pcom aneurysm that's uh, one of the favorites for uh, entrance examiners all right so this is a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage you can see the subarachnoid cisterns are uh, painted white that is because of acute blood and uh, this is also called Berry aneurysm so now I completed about the, about the superficial uh, blood supply and I mentioned how the blood vessels are lying on the surface and how the cortical territories are 
divided. Next, we are going into the deep blood supply. Deep blood supply is also equally important and maybe more confusing for many of the students, especially I've seen many final year students getting confused about the deeper blood supply. This is a coronal section. I told you a coronal section shows the cortex, subcortical white matter and the deeper part. This is the deeper part. We are focusing on this aspect. See, this is the internal carotid. Internal carotid is dividing into the anterior cerebral. I told you the T division. Internal carotid splits into anterior cerebral going midline. Okay, coming to the midline, you can see the other anterior cerebral here. And the middle cerebral that is lying in the uh, stem of the lateral sulcus. So that is the middle cerebral. From the M1 segment and from the A1 segment, you can see fine caliber branches. These are the fine caliber branches. These branches were piercing the anterior perforator substance. I told you it is perforated because it is getting pierced by these uh, small fine hair like branches and these branches fine caliber branches these will go into the depth of the brain you can see how these are going parallelly into the depth of the brain and it is supplying the basal ganglia containing the lentiform nucleus the caudate the thalamus is not shown here it's an anterior cut if you go posteriorly you can see thalamus which will not be supplied by mca it will be mainly supplied by posterior cerebral branches Okay, so all these, these branches are very important because this is also supplying the internal capsule. Look at the internal capsule. Internal capsule is supplied mainly by the lenticulostriate branches of the M1 segment, M1 segment or the stem of the MCA. So stem of the MCA gives off lenticulostriate that is called, that is supplying the internal uh, capsule. Look also this branch, this is the recurrent branch of the anterior cerebral. This is called the Hubner's artery. The Hubner's artery also supplies a part of the internal capsule, particularly the genu and the anterior limb. Mostly the anterior limb is supplied by this artery. This is called the Hubner's artery. Okay, this is the internal capsule sandwiched between the uh, caudate and the lentiform nucleus. Uh, since it is supplying uh, lentiform nucleus and the striatum, it is called the lenticulostriate branch. So uh, this is also called lateral stride. This is called medial stride. And these are all different names for the same thing. That is one problem of anatomy. We have different names for the same thing to confuse students. Okay. So this is the internal carotid. This is the MCA stem, also called M1. Okay, in in uh, neurology diagnosis, you may have you may hear uh, there is a embolus in the stem of the MCA. What do you mean by stem? This is the stem. If stem is involved, you will have cortical tertiary involvement as well as deep tertiary involvement. Imagine a case where you have a embolus occluding here. You will have internal capsule, wide region of internal capsule involvement as well as cortical involvement. Suppose you have an occlusion only on here, you will have only superior division involvement. So it basically depends on, you imagine this is just like plumbing. You imagine a, a pipeline, uh, which part of that is blocked, that much territory will be affected. So just something like that, or like water supply, if you can imagine. Uh, so this is the recurrent artery of Hubner, and this is the lenticulostriate artery. So beautiful diagram from Blumenfeld. Uh, now, um, uh, this is again the pictures that is showing the deeper branches. I mentioned this already. Here, I want you to understand this segment also. This is the P1 segment. From the P1 segment, you have fine branches that is penetrating the posterior perforated substance. This is the P1 penetrators. These are going to supply the thalamus. Okay, so the thalamus will be supplied by these perforators. These are also uh, very interesting. So all these fine caliber branches are important equal or more important than cortical branches. Not only cortical tertiaries are important, deeper tertiaries are also important. So this is one beautiful diagram and I, I, I have not seen such a diagram in anywhere else. This is the picture of the internal capsule with its different territory, uh, territory supplied by different arteries. Okay, now look very carefully. This is the first artery that I want you to uh, catch your eye. This is the middle cerebral artery perforators. This, these are the middle cerebral artery perforator or the lenticulostriate that is supplying most of the internal capsule. Okay, most of the internal capsule is supplied by these perforators. The perforators that are going like this that is supplying most of the internal capsule. Look, look, look at this, just a single shot. You can see a lot of yellow in there. That is the middle cerebral artery perforators. Okay, now look very carefully. This is anterior, this is posterior. Internal capsule is actually a, a wide, uh, just a minute. Uh, internal capsule is actually a wide, it's almost like a bokeh, uh, almost that, that is what you're seeing here. Uh, this is anterior, this is posterior. From the anterior, it is a wide uh, origin, but it all converges to a small area. Okay, you can see that that origin from here and it converges into a small area. So, this is anterior and this is posterior. Why did I say so? You can see the temporal lobe facing anteriorly. So, this is anterior, this is posterior. In the anterior limb, 
you can see one part anterior limb and the genu of the internal this is anterior limb this is genu this is posterior limb and this is retroal deform in the anterior limb you can see an area supplied by anterior cerebral artery this is the tertiary supplied by hubner's artery okay hubner so hubner's artery involvement it can preferentially involve anterior limb the caudate the caudate is on that side and also some part of the genu can be preferentially involved in a hubner's artery uh, involvement this is anterior cerebral artery perforatus that's why hubner's artery involvement can cause a facio brachial monoplegia because the the head the genu will be containing the uh, fibers descending fibers coming from the head region so that part will be preferentially involved so hubner's artery is occlusion is another cause of uh, facio brachial monoplegia classical cause of facio brachial monoplegia other than superior division of mcs stroke which i mentioned before now another color that you i want you to uh, remember here is this the green color what is a green color uh, tag that is the anterior choroidal artery i mentioned the anterior choroidal artery is a very small branch coming from the internal carotid it is mainly supplying the uh, choroidal plexus but it also supplies the depth of the brain this is the uh, anterior choroidal look at the territory where the anterior choroidal is supplying anterior choroidal is supplying the posterior limb and the retrolendiform part okay this is the globus pallidus this is a, a, a picture that is going like this okay so this is anterior limb this is genu this is posterior limb and this is the retrol in deform part the retrol in deform part is mainly occupied by the optic radiation so look how the anterior choroidal is supplying the posterior limb as well as the retrol in deform part so an anterior choroidal involvement can cause a hemiparesis of the opposite side as well as optic radiation deficits or optic field deficit of contralateral side so this is how different arteries can cause different presentations if it's deeper uh, branches fine caliber branches are also involved all right so uh, you can see another color here these are small perforators coming from the posterior cerebral i showed you that in the previous picture these are the p1 perforators these are going to uh, supply the thalamus as well as some part in the inferior aspect of uh, the internal capsule so internal capsule blood supply is quite heterogeneous the main supply is by mca perforators but you have aca perforator hubner's artery supplying anterior limb you have the retrol in deform part and part of posterior limb supplied by anterior choroidal and you have some fine uh, branches from the uh, posterior uh, cerebral and the posterior communicating that can also supply the internal capsule so it's quite heterogeneous it's not a single supply uh, of the internal capsule now this is a very good picture because this is uh, this is what you will be seeing in uh, section in in mr section mri sections or ct sections this will be the picture that you will have this is a combination this picture is a combination of cortical as well as deep tertiary first i'll go to cortical tertiary you can see the aca tertiary in the medial surface extending into the superlateral surface you can see the wide mca tertiary and you can see the pca tertiary posteriorly so so that is the cortical tertiary now we'll look at the deeper tertiaries the main supply of the internal capsule and the lendiform nucleus is by the mca deep branches or the lenticulostriate branches the anterior cerebral uh, uh, recurrent artery or the hubner's artery will be supplying anterior limb and genu along with the caudate the retro lendiform part will also be supplied by the anterior choroidal very important never forget don't think mca aca and pca is only supplying this part the anterior choroidal is also supplying it never forget next the uh, the posterior cerebral artery pca deep branches are particularly supplying the thalamus as well as some part of internal capsule also so this is a beautiful picture and here again you need to understand what are the fibers going in the internal capsule okay in the internal capsule the most important fibers are lying in the posterior limb and the genu the genu contains the facial fibers the posterior limb contains the fibers to the opposite limb so an mca stroke the mca stroke in the deeper fibers lenticulostriate fiber involvement can cause a contralateral hemiplegia uh, uh, an aca uh, hubner artery stroke can cause a preferential amount of face and some part of the arm causing a facio brachial monoplegia a retrol in deform part an anterior choroidal artery insult can cause a contralateral hemiplegia as well as field deficits because uh, optic radiation in the retrol in deform part is also involved look at how the green is going behind the lendiform so that is uh, causing opposite side optic radiation involvement also so that is that is a that is a beauty of this uh, diverse uh, supply to different tertiaries from the cortical aspect as well as the deep aspect okay 
So uh, with that, uh, I've completed the uh, cerebral superficial and deep. I'm going to a few slides that you know, already know. Uh, the stroke subtypes are uh, 15 to 20 percent will be hemorrhagic and uh, but the rest most common will be ischemic and ischemic you have two types one is thrombosis basically in the pipeline you have rust accumulating and occluding it that is called the thrombosis uh, but you have uh, an, a thrombus coming from a distal site or i mean from a proximal site either from an artery or uh, either from a proximal artery or from the heart that is called an embolic stroke okay so these are the two uh, phenomenon by which ischemic strokes can occur. You can also have a, a, a relatively uncommon variety in which you can have a severe hypoperfusion, a severe hypotension, uh, a prolonged severe hypotension, which can cause watershed infarcts. Okay, what do you mean by watershed infarcts? This is the MCA tertiary. If the MCA is involved, you can have an MCA tertiary involvement. This is again an MCA tertiary involvement, but rarely you can have a border involvement. And this is the ACA and this is the MCA the border can be in, involved. That is because the whole ACA and MCA supply has been uh, put down by a hypo, a hypotension, a severe hypotension. In that case, the borders of that tree will be affected first. So that is called a border involvement or a watershed infarct. So watershed infarct can typically occur in the borders of ACA, MCA and MCA, PCA. That's why they, you have infarcts over here. These are called border zone infarcts. So these are the thrombotic variants uh, of uh, strokes that can occur due to occlusion within the artery or coming from the distant source, either from the art, heart, like in a, uh, a mural thrombus dislodging or from a, a carotid plaque that dislodged into the artery. Now, uh, in the hemorrhagic variants, you have the, uh, the, the subarachnoid hemorrhage where one of the barrier neurisms can rupture classically, and you can also have an intracerebral bleed. The intracerebral bleed is uh, quite interesting because this is one of the uh, lenticulostriate arteries. These lenticulostriate arteries having a bulge or having an aneurysm over here. This you could, will not call this as a bury aneurysm because this is not occurring in the artery within the subarachnoid space. This is occurring within the artery. This type of uh, uh, aneurysms are called charcot Bouchard's aneurysm. And these arteries, lenticulostriate arteries are also called Charcot's arteries. Okay, so this aneurysms are potential candidates for a rupture in a later phase. Okay, so uh, this is such a, an acute bleed that has occurred in a CT and in a CT you will see acute bleed as white. Okay, this is an acute bleed that is occurring in one of the classic sites of intracerebral bleed, which is a classic site, which is the most common site for an IC bleed. It is the putamen. You can see how this netter has drawn a charcoal Bouchard aneurysm near the putamen itself. So this will rupture and cause a severe bleed in the putamen. This is the location of the putamen. Okay, this is the this is the cordate. You can see the cordate is pushed out and the location of the putamen is filled with blood. So this, what, what occurs is actually this, one of these arteries, even, even if it's a single aneurysm in a very fine caliber branch, that will rupture. And that rupture will cause a bleed. And this bleed will cause a mass effect. And that mass effect will cause shear and twisting stress on other vessels, which will eventually develop weakening of their walls and they will also rupture. So eventually the mass of blood will go on it, it is like an avalanche. It is called an avalanche effect. This, this avalanche model was actually proposed by a neurologist called Fisher. And in which even if you have a single vessel rupturing, it can eventually over time, it can cause more and more vessels rupturing and creating a mass of blood. It is actually the, the problem of this stroke is having a large intracerebral mass within the brain that has developed acutely. So that is called an intracerebral uh, bleed. So one of these lenticulostriate arteries, you can have another name is called Charcot's Bouchard aneurysms. So this is another case where you don't have an aneurysm. Instead, can you see uh, the marked area in this radiopedia image, I thank them, uh, is showing some uh, hypo-intense uh, regions. These are areas of infox, okay, old infox that has underwent liquefactive necrosis. If you have completed your pathology, you know, in the brain, necrosis will cause a liquefaction and that will cause a collection of a lacune. And that's why it's called lacuna strokes. So lacunar infox or small, Infarct. These are basically infarcts. The previous one was a bleed. It is rupture of blood vessel. Here it is an infarct. You have uh, occlusion and it, uh, the uh, tissue over there has died. This can occur in the internal capsule. It can occur in the uh, basal ganglia. These are classically called lacunar infarcts. And typically they are less than 15 millimeter in diameter. And they occur in the distribution of deep penetrating vessel. Okay. These, these uh, lacunar infarcts are very common. And if it is occurring in the posterior limb of internal capsule, it can cause a pure motor uh, lacunar infarct. It can cause motor and sensory infarct. It can cause ataxic hemiparesis. 
uh, because internal capsule contains not only sensory and motor fibers it also contains fibers uh, going to the cerebellum so all these variants if if this is occurring within the thalamus it can cause a pure sensory stroke that is called a thalamic stroke so anywhere within this deep part of the brain supplied by the deep penetrating vessels can undergo a thrombosis and cause a lacunar infarct so lacunar infarct is typically less than 15 mm infarct so that is about cerebrum which is the main uh, topic of my presentation today next i'll just brush through brain stem and cerebellum brain stem blood supply you can remember if you know the course of vertebral artery vertebral artery runs like this gives off anterior spinals gives off a posterior inferior cerebellar joins as the basilar at the ponto medullary junction so till the medulla you have the vertebral artery giving off medullary branches the basilar artery runs in the prepontine system that will give off the penetrating branches to the uh, pons then at the ponto mesencephalic junction or the midbrain pons junction it will separate into two midbrain uh, two posterior cerebral arteries which will again give branches uh, to the uh, anterior part of the midbrain so these are the how the branches uh, go towards the brain stem and you classically have territories in the brain stem also which i'm not going to that details today because uh, of the time lack but i'll just mention in the uh, midline you have vertebral artery paramedian branches laterally you have vertebral artery lateral branches including the posterior inferior cerebellar artery very important that is why pica involvement though it is cerebellar artery that can cause a lateral medullary syndrome so very commonly asked question lateral medullary syndrome caused by pica because pica though it is supplying cerebellum you can see the light blue color in the cerebellum it is having a territory of supply on the lateral part of the medulla never forget that is pica next in the pons you have the basilar perforators in the midline and they are called uh, they are they are basilar uh, the midline perforators you also have laterally going circumferential perforators okay. in in over here you will have the p posterior sir p1 and p2 segments perforators will be penetrate uh, will be supplying the midbrain remember the pca is also supplying the uh, the posterior inferior part of the cerebrum also so that that's why you have that uh, brown color all over here including so the posterior cerebral is not only supplying the cerebrum it is also supplying the medial part of the midbrain due to the uh, the penetrating branches as you saw thalamus is also being supplied by the penetrating branches of posterior cerebral so uh, the the map of the cerebral blood supply and the brain stem blood supply is not so neat okay that that's a point you need to remember uh, you have overlaps example pica is also supplying the lateral part of the middle uh, classically right and you have classic brain stem syndromes i'm not going into the details weber benedict claude are described in the midbrain uh, millard gobler fovillae described in the pons and uh, medial medullary and lateral medullary described in the medulla if i need uh, to explain this i need to show uh, what all structures are there in the brain stem which i'll not be doing now which uh, we'll be doing in a later phase now coming to the cerebellar blood supply cerebellar blood supply uh, is basically again three blood vessels which i already mentioned you have the pica arising from the vertebral never forget pica is arising from the vertebral that is supplying the posterior inferior cerebellum also gaining lateral part of medulla never forget the ica coming from the lower part of the uh, basilar supplying the anterior inferior cerebellum also the uh, middle cerebellar pedangle part then the superior cerebellar artery supplying the uh, superior part of the cerebellum these are the territories that are described the green one is the sca territory the ica supplying the middle cerebellar pedangle and the anterior inferior part of the cerebellum and the pica representing the rest remember pica is also supplying lateral part of medulla with that i have completed the brain uh, circulation arterial segment next i'll go to a quiz just to uh, just to you know uh, wake you up so ashley can i uh, can i see the answers within the chat i'll go to a small quiz okay with that i think uh, i'll just uh after that i'll go to five slides of uh, uh venous anatomy uh, and then i'll close so the first question is uh, uh which is the most common artery involved to cause a lateral medullary syndrome which is the most uh, common artery involved to cause a lateral medullary syndrome choices are pica ica medullary branches vertebral artery basilar artery can i get the answers okay uh, i think most of you have uh, written pica uh, some have written medullary branches 
pika 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 everyone has written pika okay very good pika will cause lateral medullary syndrome that is right pika will cause lateral medullary syndrome but please read the question which is the most common artery involved to cause a lateral medullary syndrome the answer ib hos very good the answer is vertebral artery okay the answer is vertebral artery because uh, i i'll show you why the statistic is i told you repeatedly pica is definitely the artery that is involving the lateral part of medulla it is also supplying the lower posterior part of cerebellum but the question is which is the most common artery involved to cause a lateral medullary syndrome uh, thank you for all your answers the most common answer is obviously pica but that is the most common answer the, the correct answer is vertebral artery now these are the references i want this is the most important reference that i want you to remember because it's one of the standard text harrisons which describes most cases of wallenberg syndrome also called the posterior inferior cerebral pica syndrome it's called pica syndrome but it is a result of ipsilateral Uh, vertebral artery occlusion in the remainder pica occlusion is responsible this is a recent study uh, not a recent study in 2003 study uh, in which uh, 130 cases of lateral medullary uh, syndromes were uh, assessed uh, in a standard journal uh, called brain and in that you, i want you to look at this statement angiograms performed in 123 patients showed vertebral artery disease in 67% and pica disease in 10% so it is true that pica is the territory that is involving uh, the uh, pica is the uh, territory that is going to involve uh, i mean uh, th that is the territory that is responsible for the lateral medullary syndrome but the vessel that is involved my question was the vessel that is involved uh, the most common artery that is involved the answer is vertebral artery so uh, look at this picture is again by netter you can see how the pica is arising to supply the cerebellum and the pica is definitely also the territory that is supplying the lateral medullary but look a very subtle thing that the uh, that dr netter has done he had put a uh, thrombus within the vertebral artery okay so that is that is the same statement written in harrisons and in that brain journal the uh, the vertebral artery involvement is the most common blood vessel involvement that can cause a pica yeah i mean that can cause a wallenberg syndrome Uh, though wallenberg syndrome territory is supplied by pica the main reason the main logic is pica is a branch of vertebral artery so uh, disease of the vertebral artery is more common than disease of the pica so what are the features of wallenberg syndrome i'll just brush through it causes ataxia vertigo and nausea these are the most debilitating symptoms for the patient because you will have vestibular nuclear involvement inferior cerebellar pedangle involvement cerebellum involvement so that will cause these and that is most debilitating for the patient you also have classic Uh, ipsilateral face pain and temperature involvement because uh, of the uh, spinal nucleus of trigeminal and the spinal tract of trigeminal involvement that will cause ipsilateral face involvement of pain and temperature you'll also have contralateral pain and temperature involvement of the body because the spinothalamic tract has already crossed within the spine within the spinal cord so you'll have contralateral involvement of pain and temperature in the body ipsilateral involvement of pain and temperature in the face the details of this you need to understand the anatomy of the medulla which i'll be not be going through that now you will have ipsilateral honors because of descending sympathetics uh, you know the sympathetic involvement is called honors on one side and you will have hoarseness dysphagia this is also disabling for the patient because of nucleus ambiguus involvement nucleus ambiguus is the motor nucleus of the vagus nerve so you will have difficulty in swallowing uh, sound will be hoarse and you will have ipsilateral decreased taste because of nucleus tractus solitaris involvement if i need to explain all this i'll go i need two more sessions like this now uh, that is question number 1 i'll have five questions okay uh, now uh, next is i'll have stroke blood vessel localization corresponding to this is a beautiful tweet image by dr jeremy hayt of stanford i i uh, took it from uh, him uh, with with thanks to him and uh, this is the basic vertebral artery i mean the uh, circle of willis and i'm going to through each of these to understand each of how each of the occlusions can uh, cause presentations okay uh, with uh, mr images with mri diffusion i think it is diffusion weighted images uh, which is the classic first line uh, the early imaging modality which can give out a, a, a source of ischemia so i mean the it can image ischemia so i think it is diffusion weighted image i'm not very sure about that probably radiology uh, aspirants or radiologists can mention about that so we'll look at the images and look at the territories and understand how each of these occlusion of each of these arteries can cause uh, different patterns okay first one is the uh, yeah first one is the anterior spinal artery is arising from the uh, vertebral i didn't mention about anterior spinal already but if anterior spinal artery is involved zoom it you can see involvement of the anterior part of the spinal cord okay anterior part of the spinal cord the next is a pica involvement which can cause cerebellum and the lateral medulla this is the lateral medulla lateral medulla and the cerebellum will be involved in a 
uh, pica vessel occlusion. The next is the ica vessel occlusion, which can, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, the next is an ica vessel involvement in which uh, you can have middle cerebellar pedangle and the anterior inferior part of the cerebellum uh, involved. These are all axial section images, okay? Axial section images. Yeah, now the next is uh, a basilar perforator. As you know, basilar perforators are going to supply the pons. So you can see a pontine infarct on one side, a unilateral pontine infarct on one side in this image. Now, the next is a, a, a superior cerebellar artery involvement, where again you have superior cerebellar surfaces, an upper cut, okay? Uh, an upper cut in which superior cerebellar one side territory is involved. The next is a posterior cerebral, a large posterior cerebral insult where you can see, look very carefully, you can see posterior part of thalamus involved. Why? Because you have penetrating branches of the PC, P1 that is going to supply the thalamus. So you have thalamic territory that can be involved, but also the cortical territories that will supply the posterior part of the cortical, uh, uh, the, the cortical salsa and gyri, including the visual cortex. So remember, PCA uh, involvement not only involves cortex, but it can also involve thalamus, also the upper part of midbrain, they can also be involved in a PCA stroke. Okay. So that, that is about PCA. Next, we are going to the anterior choroidal. Look at the anterior choroidal. I mentioned the anterior choroidal, a small branch of internal carotid. If that is involved, it can cause uh, uh, insult of the, it can cause an effect, affliction of the, uh, the posterior limb as well as the retral lentiform. This is the uh, lentiform nucleus. Behind the lentiform nucleus, you have the retral lentiform. So this will cause a contralateral hemiplegia as well as visual field deficit. Okay, it's a beautiful picture because it's a very good summary integrating all anatomy as well as imaging uh, with clinical presentations, if you can think about that too. Now we'll go to the next part. We'll go to more into the anterior circulation. This is one of the lenticulostriate branches. The lenticulostriate, one of the lenticulostriate branches occlusion that can cause a lacunar infarct, as I mentioned before, but earlier you can see that infarct regions in the depth of the uh, cerebrum. Okay, so the, because it's a deep artery that is going to supply the cerebrum. Uh, sorry, yeah. The next we have an, this is this is the middle cerebral artery. This is the lenticulostriate. This is the inferior division. If inferior division is involved, temporal lobe and uh, posterior part of parietal lobe will be involved. If superior division is involved, if superior division is involved, frontal and anterior part of the parietal can be involved. So that is a superior division uh, involvement M2. This is an M2 inferior division involvement. Now, uh, this is an M1 segment uh, involvement. Very, very important. You need to understand the difference between this, this, and this, okay? And this one. If M1 is involved, you will have the entire territory, the superior division, inferior division, you sum up, you add the deeper territory, you will get the total M1 occlusion. This is the stem of MCA infarct. Remember, stem of MCA infarct will have cortical involvement as well as deep involvement, including internal capsule. Okay, so you'll have a dense hemiplegia, you'll have cortical signs, including aphasia if it is on the left side. Okay, so you need to integrate all these things together to understand the real beauty of it. Now, the next is, uh, you, if it is an ICA stroke, it's, it's really massive. Look at the ACA tertiary and MCA tertiary involvement with some sparing of the PCA tertiary involvement. Suppose in this IC, if it is a, a fetal PCOM, you will have a, a, a PCA tertiary involvement also. Okay, so ICA tertiary infarct, a large ICA tertiary infarct, infarct is basically ACA plus MCA infarct. The next is uh, ACA infarct, which will cause midline involvement. Midline involvement. You'll have classically uh, opposite side monoplegia. You can ha also have frontal lobe symptoms. I, I'm mentioning only about motor symptoms. If frontal lobe is involved, you can have abulia, a kinetic mutism that can all be seen in ACA strokes. Okay. Now, coming to quiz, quiz number two. Can someone tell me what is this? Which is which uh, artery involvement can cause this? Look very carefully and give me an answer. Which artery involvement can cause this? Where should I look for answers? Uh, I have to go for chat. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Recurrent branch of Hubner. Uh, that is what is said by uh, many, many students have said recurrent artery of Hubner. Many, some said vertebral. No, no, that's early. Ophthalmic. No, no, no. Ophthalmic will not have a uh, brain involvement. Okay, ophthalmic is going only to the eye. So this is a recurrent artery of Hubner. Actually, the, the term is actually, I read somewhere that it's called recurrent artery of Heubner because he, he's actually a German and the pronunciation is Heubner. I'm not very sure about that. I read somewhere that it's called Heubner. So 
very good you have listened very carefully it is uh, it is uh, involving the caudate nucleus and the anterior limb of the internal capsule so it can cause a facio brachial monoplegia it can also cause uh, caudate nucleus involvement uh, which can cause uh, movement disorder so it is called the recurrent artery of hubner we are very correct uh, that is a sorry yeah that is called the recurrent artery of hubner very good uh, also called distal medial striate branches uh, from the aca okay aca distal medial striate branches now i'm going to next quiz okay five quiz, uh, quiz questions the next quiz is probably you may not be able to answer this one this artery this artery is arising from p1 i've not mentioned this artery but if anyone can answer uh, good for you okay it is a p1 artery this is a very unique artery it's actually a very rare artery you have a single you i you seen earlier that from the p1 segment you have a lot of fine hairy branches going into the posterior perforated substance i mentioned that before this is a specific case in which you have a single branch and that single branch occlusion from that single branch you have multiple branches that is going to perforate posterior perforated substance so if you have this branch involvement occlusion it can cause uh this picture what is this anyone anyone can anyone answer this if you can answer this is well and good i'm not able to see the answers where, where should i go i'm go to chat it's not coming up so you can see the answers in the yeah, chat it, yeah i saw it very good sharon glen very good you mentioned it as artery of percheron very good this is called the artery of percheron very good this is called the artery of percheron artery of percheron aop this is artery of hubner okay so many named Uh, doctors and scientists this is again a german gerard percheron uh, this is a single artery this is a variant a single artery dividing into multiple small perforated branches that is going to supply the thalamus so look at this picture it is having involvement of medial part of uh, thalamus medial part of thalamus on both sides a single artery occlusion causing bilateral thalamic infarcts that is a rare artery of percheron uh, very good uh, someone answered it very good uh, so they are called uh, artery of percheron okay artery of percheron is a variant it is a variant but if you have an artery of percheron uh, in fact it can cause bilateral thalamic involvement bilateral thalamic involvement is very important because both thalamus if both of thalamus or both frontal lobes are uh, involved in a disease that can cause a, a flexion of consciousness consciousness system okay so this is one of the cause of acute onset drowsiness or coma okay in such a way aop artery of percheron is unique it's a very rare don't think it's very common it's very rare Uh, but it's very interesting because it's a single artery it's a variant you can read about it okay artery of percheron very good uh, for the one who answered and uh, what is a pointed structure anyone can you answer this what is a pointed structure <clears throat> what is a pointed structure as a case uh, a ct image i didn't write that it is a ct image it is an acute dysphasia that means uh, aphasia or facial droop so it looks like an acute cerebrovascular event clinically and on ct this is the thing that is seen what is this putamen internal capsule posterior carotid artery no that, that is early broca seria what is this you are seeing it as a white structure you are seeing it as a white anyone who can answer i i not mentioned this someone said bleeding uh you're close to it it is it is it looks like a bleed acute uh, acute bleed uh, looks somewhat like this but i'm not very sure why it is not a bleed why it is a thrombus it's actually a thrombus but can you tell me where that thrombus is it is an m1 thrombus abhirami written it as m1 thrombus you are very close someone written it is mca very good good this is actually the course of the mca i told you mca goes like this the internal carotid comes like this and it splits into aca going medially okay aca will be running like this and mca will be running like this in the stem of the lateral sulcus so some of you have written very good they have written uh, mca they have written it as uh, uh, okay very good i'll i'll stem of mca uh, you know what is a dense mca sign nilup nilup nilutpal da, das very good very good this is called the dense mca sign you are very correct okay this is called the dense mca sign this is actually the course of the mca you cannot see the blood vessels normally in a ct uh, you can do it in an angiogram to see the blood vessels but this is a non contra ct in which in very rarely in the initial hyper acute phase after a stroke after an ischemic stroke you may see this rare finding this is visualizing the mca clot 
the MCA thrombus in the M1 segment. <coughs> Sorry, visualizing the MCA clot in the M1 segment. This is called the dense MCA sign. This is relatively rare, but you may see it in the initial acute phase. Uh, in the initial presentation of the stroke, you may see it in the non-contrast CT, and this is called the dense MCA sign. You can read more about it in Radiopedia. I, I took most of the images from Radiopedia, with, which has a, a license, a Creative Commons li license image can be used. So uh, I use that, uh, thanks for them. And this is the dense MCA sign. You're very good uh, for the person who answered it. And all of them who found it as MCA, and you found it as M1 segment, good, very good. So uh, the next I'm going to another uh, case. This is again similar. Another name for this. So this is the fifth question. Can you tell me what is this? What is the point of structure? Okay, clue. Do you need a clue? No, many of them are answering, I think. Very good. I'm not very sure. Uh, uh, in fact, M2, in the insula, very good. This is the sylvian fissure, very good, very good. You have very good cross-sectional anatomy sense, very good. This is the sylvian fissure, and so this is the insula. You are seeing M2. Sharon, you are right, right. This is M2. Anaka has written it is MCA, correct? Correct. This is similar to the previous one. This is, again, you are visualizing the clot within the insula segment or the M2 segment, this is called the MCA dot sign. Okay, MCA dot sign. If you look at this picture again, this was the dense MCA sign where you, it looked like a, a thread of clot lying in the dense, uh, in an axial section. But here you will see as dots because they will actually be running on the uh, surface of the insula. So you will view it as dots, okay? So you'll view it as dots. That is called an MCA dot sign. This is again seen in the radio period. You can read about it. Okay, so the dense MCA and MCA dot sign, you'll get a better idea of it if you have a visual imagery of how the MCA artery is going through, how the M1 is located, how the M1 is giving off lenticulostriate, how it is lying in the depth of the insula and how it is climbing up the opercula and coming into the cortex and supplying the entire cortical territory. Very good. So thanks for answering all this. Now, venous anatomy, I think I'll do it in two minutes. Okay, quick. This is the, uh, mostly I'll give you uh, some uh, Quiz points. With that, I'll close. This is the superficial cortical veins, again, lying along with cortical arteries, uh, but the venous anatomy is a little more complex. This is a superficial middle cerebral vein. Unlike you have a middle cerebral artery, here you have a superficial middle cerebral vein, and that is connected to the uh, superior sagittal sinus by this. This is called the superior anastomotic vein of Trollard. Okay, this is relatively large, and you classically it crosses the parietal lobe. Okay, next you have the inferior anastomotic vein that classically crosses the temporal lobe. This is the temporal lobe. So that is the inferior anastomotic vein of the lab, of labbe. Okay, this is vein of labbe and vein of trilatic, usual entrance questions that you may get. And this is called a superficial middle cerebral vein. Okay, the superficial middle cerebral vein classically drains into uh, sphenoparietal sinus or to the cavernous sinus. Okay, all of these veins are eventually going to drain to uh, uh, the dural venous sinuses. Uh, class on dural venous sinuses is one hour, so I'll not go into that, but I just want you to identify this is superior sagittal sinus, this is the inferior sagittal sinus, and this is straight sinus. Straight sinus is formed by the inferior sagittal sinus joining with the great cerebral vein of Gallen. This is called the vein of Gallen. Both of them join to form this uh, uh, straight sinus. The straight sinus and the superior sagittal sinus will meet at the confluence of sinuses. Most common mistake made by students, they say superior sagittal sinus and inferior sagittal sinus. No. Straight sinus and the Superior sagittal sinus. Straight sinus runs like this. Superior sagittal sinus runs like this. Both of them meet at the confluence of sinus, also called torculophyrophily, and they part into the two transverse sinuses, or the lateral sinus, also called lateral sinus. That is what you are seeing here. And finally, uh, the lateral sinus will run like this and uh, exit out uh, in the jugular foramen. You can see accompanying cranial nerves that will exit out. You can see a lot of other uh, dural venous sinuses. All of these are important, but I'm not going into that. It'll, it'll be draining the entire brain, will be, uh, will be draining into the dural venous sinus, and from that there, it'll be coming out. Okay, that's the point you need to remember. Now, veins within the brain are usual questions, uh, can be questions in your exams, okay, especially anatomy exams or for entrance exams, eh? because they are confusing. Many students get it wrong. So, uh, this, these are called the internal cerebral veins. So, the venous anatomy is basically like you have outside superficial venous drainage and a deeper venous drainage. In the deeper venous drainage, you have this internal cerebral veins, which is basically lying in the velum interpositum, also called a stelochoroidea. This stelochoroidea uh, will 
is for this internal cerebral vein is jaw is formed by the thalamostriate vein this is the thalamostriate vein it have, has a lot of chordate veins beautiful chordate veins that you can see if you cut the lateral ventricle you can see this chordate vein bulges and that will form the thalamostriate vein that will join with the choroidal vein this is the choroidal plexus that will have a choroidal vein those two will join at the foramen mondro and become the internal cerebral vein these two internal cerebral veins drain backwards and join with the basal vein of Rosenthal to form the great cerebral vein of Gallen. Okay, this is the great cerebral vein of Gallen. So in, eventually you need to understand the great cerebral vein of Gallen is draining the core of the brain. The cortical veins are draining into superior sagittal sinus, transverse sinus, and they will be draining from the superficial part of the brain. That's a basic idea of the venous anatomy that you can have. Another question that can be, so what is great cerebral vein of Gallen that is formed by the internal cerebral vein joined with the basal vein of Rosenthal. Now, what is basal vein of Rosenthal? Basal vein of Rosenthal, you can see that if you upturn the brain, you're looking from inferior to the basal part of the brain. This is the basal vein of Rosenthal. It is formed by the deep middle cerebral vein. Okay, very, very important. Look, look over here, you, can, you know that this is M1 segment and this is M2 segment. The accompanying structure of the M2 segment is the deep middle cerebral vein. The superficial middle cerebral vein is lying on the, super, on the superficial aspect. You saw that when you remove the dura, you can see the superficial middle cerebral vein. So in the lateral sulcus, you have one artery that is a middle cerebral artery, M2 and the M3 and M4 segments. But the veins are, you have a superficial middle cerebral vein and a deep middle cerebral vein. So one of the common anatomy questions asked is, what is the uh, what are the components of the sylvian fissure? You can write all this, superficial middle cerebral vein on the surface, deep middle cerebral vein on the depth, along with the M2 segment arteries. Okay. So the, that deep middle cerebral vein joins with the anterior cerebral vein, which is the accompanying structure of the anterior cerebral artery. Those two will join near the anterior perforated substance and form the basal vein of Rosenthal that will join, go backwards and join with the internal cerebral vein forming the VOG or the vein of Gallen. Okay. So final drainage is to the IJV. Now, one point I want you to understand is in the tocula of urophily, there is a usual pattern. The superior sagittal sinus drains to the right side. The straight sinus drains to the left side. This is the usual pattern. So, yes, superior sagittal sinus drains to the right. Straight sinus drains to the left. And I already mentioned straight sinus receives vein of Gallen that is coming from the core of the brain. So there is a somewhat a preponderance of the core of the brain to drains towards the left transverse sinus and the surface of the brain draining into the superior cycle sinus go to the right transverse sinus. And finally, the transverse sinus becomes sigmoid sinus and drains into IJV. So the left IJV is somewhat draining the core of the brain and the right IJV is somewhat draining the surface of the brain. That's a, a, a relative preponderance like that. Okay, so that may be significant in some cases. So with that, uh, I think I'll finish up. Uh, finally, draining the IJV. Okay. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, if you have any comments or any doubts, you can approach me in my email ID. This is doorshop54 gmail.com. And uh, if you are interested, uh, you can see my YouTube channel, which I've started a couple of months back, uh, no, a few months back. Uh, it's called Air Anatomy because I use a lot of gestures in several scenarios to teach short topics of anatomy. It's not extensive, but if you are interested, you can kindly support me. So with that, I'll finish up. Uh, if you have any doubts, you can ask. If, uh, if you have any comments, please reach out in my email. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for being here and uh, being a true inspiration and uh, teaching us this topic. Thank you, thank, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, thank you for the deep. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to thank the IMA. I would like to thank IMA MSN, the moderators, uh, uh, especially Justin who uh, contacted me, and uh, I would like to also thank all my colleagues in my department uh, who have even helped me. Uh, my postgraduate students who have helped me in preparing the slides also. Uh, my colleagues, a lot of my colleagues, including my head of the department, my uh, senior teachers, and my uh, junior colleagues also. Thanks to all of them, and thanks to all thank my you. listeners. Thank, thank you. Thank have you. a good day. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you.